äh, es geht um Enablers für Electro Aviation, also all das, was außer den reinen Flugzeugen, Fahrzeugen noch wichtig ist. Sorry, I said we have the talks in English, so I have to switch language. Sorry, repeat, repeat again. Welcome to the third session of the eFlight Forum uh, this year at Aero Friedrichshafen 2022. And we have a lot of speakers, as you see, so I keep myself short and I, we are talking about companies which are doing products, services which will enable electric flight and eVTOL for uh, aviation around the world. So companies come from around the world and I pass my hand, uh, my microphone, not my hand, <laughs> I pass my mic uh, to our first speaker who is uh, Tony from Bosch General Aviation and uh, yeah Tony it's yours and if you can have the first presentation Hello, good afternoon everybody. My name is Tony Jake Angelo. I'm President and General Manager of Bosch Aviation Technology in Michigan, USA. And I would like to give you a, a short introduction about uh, how automotive innovation can enable uh, into aerospace. From a first point of view, uh, key strategic targets, I think that should be a good fit. Uh, high focus on digitalization. Um, in automotive, we pursue a powertrain mix, which means uh, combustion engines, uh, electric, hybrid electric, and also hydrogen. Uh, of course, why are we doing that? Reduction of emissions, that is the most important, and we will do all that under the point of cost efficiency, not only of components, but over the whole life cycle. If we look at battery electric vehicles, uh, we take a system approach from uh, semiconductors like micro-mechanical sensors or silicon carbide to improve efficiency uh, over the components, electric motors, EXO, uh, power modules, inverter, all the way to the in powertrain integration into a rolling chassis. The same approach for hydrogen, being it hydrogen combustion or hydrogen fuel cell, also a fuel system approach where we uh, supply the components like air compressor, uh, hydrogen injector, actuator, sensors, uh, all the way up to the integration into a power pack. Uh, the stack, for the stack we will use external uh, suppliers. Uh, bringing this all together, what is our business proposition uh, to enable e-aviation? That is, we can supply readily available prototype components for proof of concepts. Um, we manage innovation and we implement the latest uh, technology standards in our products. Um, we are good in uh, series manufacturing, providing highest quality and leading in implementing Industry 4.0 uh, principles. And yeah, last but not least, we have a worldwide uh, network of series manufacturing uh, focusing on cost efficiency and uh, helping the value chain to implement CO2 neutrality. Okay, that is from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much and uh, really thank you for keeping it short as we have many speakers and a short session and I want to have time for Q&A and there will be a mic so also you when you're in the, uh, not on the stage but um, in the, what do you say, crowd? <laughs> uh, uh, when, when you have questions there will be a mic which will be handed around. So our next speaker is uh, Christian Mundigler from FACC also supplying services to uh, the aviation industry and Christian will tell us which ones. Yeah, on behalf of FSCC, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome to the world of FSCC Beyond Horizon. It's an honor to be here uh, and talk about uh, UAM and, and uh, Advanced Air Mobility. So we are fully committed to the sky at all levels. Since more than 30 years we uh, produce lightweight components for aviation and this is still a very 
uh, huge and growing market as you know only 20% of the world population was ever flying so there's enough uh, growth potential but we decided to look further up into the space and also into the advanced and urban air mobility. So our corporate mission is we design the future of mobility with the materials of tomorrow. You could also say materials and processes of tomorrow. So uh, since more than 30 years we are used uh, to produce the components for Airbus, Boeing, Embraer, uh, Bombardier, Comac, etc. And so we lay in the field up to 700 aircraft per year. Um, and the next challenge is then uh, higher outputs for the air taxis. Uh, it's still not comparable with the automotive production, something in between. Uh, and our strategy is to bring in all the experience from the last 30 years from aviation, but we invest heavily in new technologies and materials and processes uh, and to learn from that, bring it back to aviation uh, to, to gain the advantages out of that. So, key is of course fast curing resin systems uh, to, to achieve high output rate and uh, low curing temperatures uh, compared to the standard uh, aerospace material grades. And uh, so, uh, away from the autoclave, uh, other flexible uh, processes and a high performance and low cost material focus. We have to come down with the cost between 30 and 50 percent. So we, I, as mentioned, we invest heavily in building up these competences. So uh, we sourced that press for Thermoset and Thermoblast um, and the future materials we are focusing on when it comes to the Thermoset is pre-break, compression molding and high pressure RTM and uh, sheet metal compound. <coughs> sheet molding compound, sorry. On the Thermoblast side is uh, the Thermoblast uh, stamp forming, I will show you pictures later, Thermoblast bulk injection molding um, and uh, additive manufacturing of course. So the autoclave technology is limited uh, to scale, we need to think beyond. Potential processes, fast curing resin as mentioned, uh, the first on the left side so thermoset material qualified for curing resin systems needed and fast preforming needed as well. On the stamp forming, the thermoplast material is high performance but less integration. So we are mainly focusing on hybrid molding with the thermoplast. Here is especially essential the rib interface quality as a, a challenge. To the thermoset processing, uh, the pre baked compression molding from the Solway patent uh, we already tried, you see on the, on the right corner, um, a spoiler, we produce all the spoilers, 787 and Airbus A350, single source, since many years, and in the future it could look like that, three uh, components pressed in one uh, step, and this in overall tuck times below 10 minutes. On the resin transfer molding, we have good experience since many years on the hinges from the spoilers. So this is a technology we already introduced to Boeing and to Airbus and is, is in use since many, many years. So you have tack times less than 30 minutes, mainly a two-component uh, high-pressure RTM system. Uh, the filling time around 120 seconds at 30 bar and the injection curing at 130 degrees Celsius and uh, later on curing freestanding 180 degree. On the thermoplast processing you see the process flow from the raw material uh, to the uh, laminates or tailored blank uh, to the components itself and of course the assembly. And when it comes to the assembly, inductive welding is the latest and greatest here. Uh, we, uh, we found partnerships like uh, with the Linz Institute of Technology, uh, like the MIT is the LIT. So we invest and, and finance and subsidize uh, the university in Linz in Upper Austria. And uh, as a return, we can use their uh, assembly line and do the first small parts learning. Interesting is the process 
uh, of hybrid injection molding uh, because there is no waste, we reuse the waste and also the scrap is reused and we also play with uh, green uh, stuff um, when it comes to the fiber for example, cocos, uh, sugar cane, etc. because urban air mobility should be sustainable to increase social acceptance and of course uh, minimize the CO2 footprint. Yeah, bio-based prepacks, uh, they, uh, we already uh, displayed sidewalls from the A320 Airbus sidewall as we are the manufacturer floor to floor. Uh, everything in the A320 and A350 cabin we already uh, displayed in 2018 in Hamburg such sidewalls um, made out of uh, sugar cane molas resin. When you cure that material, the whole factory is smelling like uh, caramel sugar. So it's really uh, cool. All the advantages of the high performing prepack, plus fiber prepacks, uh, plus additional the sustain sustainability and of course the, the health etc. and no disadvantages by the way. So the strategy on the advanced and urban air mobility of FSCC is pretty much the same as uh, in the aviation, becoming a technology partner for all the uh, potential future OEM customers with our three divisions, aerostructure, engine nacelle, cabin interiors. Number four is aftermarket services, is my own division. So we really want to offer a complete life cycle approach. We offer the entire value chain or customized uh, like the customer wants. Ideally, of course, from the beginning to the end, from research to the uh, overhaul. Uh, we are a design organization, a production organization and maintenance organization and we are quite independent and fast. Uh, our advantage is that we have more than 30 years experience in certification, um, so, so we can combine whatever advantages from the automotive side. We are hiring quite a bunch of people out of the automotive production side, but we have this knowledge since more than three decades EASA design, organization approval of course, certification support, compliance demonstration showing everything in-house by the way. You see here the cold component laboratory and testing is owned by FSCC 100%. Um, we do really big full-scale testing there. Uh, we have all the uh, certifying stuff and uh, DO, DO and DO arrangement we can put in place and we are also able to do all the material allowance testing in-house uh, in order to become a partner or subcontractor uh, of our customers. So in a nutshell, HL flexible and experienced coming from aviation, exploring and investing heavily in the advanced and urban mobility. Thank you for your attention. Thank you Christian. And, uh just is handing over the microphone to Dr. Stefan Breuning from Rolls-Royce. We've had Rolls-Royce uh, since nearly the beginning of eFlight Expo, presenting you on a regular base. And uh, we know that you're enabling with the electric motors, but there is more stuff I hear from you now. <clears throat> exactly. Thank you very much for having us. So, Carolyn and I would really like to share our perspective on electric aircraft charging and energy infrastructure because we think this will be an important enabler to really make electric flight practical, to make it cost efficient and also really truly sustainable. So as you mentioned, Rolls-Royce, we're working on the full electric power and propulsion system. So the electric engines, the electric uh, propulsion units, the power distribution and also the battery systems for the, uh, for the aircraft. So we understand designing a battery for aerospace application is quite challenging. You need to um, achieve the energy density that you need to have your range. You need to think about the safety cases, the integration in the airframe, but also battery cycle life and how you properly charge such a battery. Because it's not trivial, so you can do quite a lot wrong if you charge an aerospace battery on an aircraft. And just, yep, so yes, we have made the swap space. No, it's fine. I, I pretty I, I know the picture, and I, we don't have a presentation. Just one really nice. I, I think it's really nice. Just one picture, which shows our vision of uh, charging of electric aircraft. And so it's just 
interesting to take a step back. If we think about these EVTOL aircraft, and it could also be a commuter aircraft with maybe nine pucks, um, you will have an energy storage system between 100 to 250 kilowatt hours. And that's roughly twice or even three times the size of what you have in a usual mid-class sedan, like a Tesla Model 3. So three times the size of the size of the battery. And you need to have a quick turnaround time. So you really want to have a short turnaround time at a Worthy port or a regional airport. So you need high charging power. And what we're talking about for such an application is something 500, 600 kilowatts or some airframers even going up to one megawatt of charging power, which is, again, if you think about a, an electric car, you could charge up to 250 kilowatts with a Tesla if you find a charging pole, um, but here we're talking about three times the charging power. Now, doing a quick calculation, maybe we simulated this word you bought here with six stands, six fast chargers, and the energy demand really grows quite quickly and is really peaky. And that brings a lot of challenges. If you think about where you ports in urban environments or regional airports, um, the airport here in Friedrichshafen, for example, um, if you have these capabilities at the airport, it's quite a challenge to deal with this high energy demand because you need to have the reliability in the grid and you really want to make sure the energy is sustainable. So you need a solution which is really looking at this holistically. And that's the perfect, so I described the problem and for the solution I'm just handing it over to Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So um, with our MacGrid solutions, we are providing the required energy to airports and also future battery ports because you could think that the grid connection reinforcement to the next supra-regional network or grid is pretty expensive. So now you might ask yourself, what exactly is a microgrid? So what are we at Rolls-Royce doing? So a microgrid is a decentralized energy system and it's actually consisting of different components. So most commonly we are integrating renewable sources. You can see it here, for example, the PV panels on the rooftop of the um, airport, but it also might be wind. And we are then using this green energy to, for example, charge aircrafts, but also to support the airport and to store the energy. Um, we have various ways of storing this energy and for later then retrieval. So one way to store the energy, you also can see it here in the picture, so is our battery energy storage systems. They are lithium ion based and um, they are then providing the airport with uh, megawatts of capacity. Um, other components of our microgrid microgrid ecosystems might be, for example, gensets operated by sustainable fuels. Um, also then going forward, we're having hydrogen solutions. So thinking of fuel cells and then which are enabled by, um, by via our electrolyzers. So um, yeah, and then actually at the, the, the heart or the brain of our whole microgrid system is then our microgrid controller who is like connecting all the dots and these different components like fuel cell, electrolyzer, renewable energy sources and so on. And then it's distributing the energy like to the optimal requirements of the airport. So then also taking into consideration the weather conditions, weather forecasts and so on. So that's how we at Wolf Royce um, provide holistic microgrid solutions for the future ener energy infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suppose there will be some questions later. If you could pass the microphone to your neighbor, Corbin Huber from Skyroads, and he's speaking about another little bit which will, uh, hope we will make electric aviation and especially EV toll possible. Thank you, Willy. Um, do we have a presentation up here? So, um, Skyroads is Skyroads builds automated air traffic control. Now, let's talk for a moment about what enabling means in our industry. Um, is there? Can we? Can we? Up to beeper. Thank you. Um, 
there are many ways of enabling urban air mobility and EVTOLs. Billy did a smart thing, he didn't really say what we're enabling. He said EVTOLs and urban air mobility and advanced air mobility and regional air mobility. So um, that's why we're, we're a pretty big crowd here because there are lots of things we can enable. And I applaud everybody who is enabling it, but I'd like to talk about one very specific challenge we're having. Everybody here knows that whatever we're talking about will only fly if it scales. We're all going to be very happy at home again and not working on aircraft if we don't find mass applications for these vehicles. Now when we're talking mass applications, we need decentralized energy systems like you guys were talking about. But last and not least, we need to be safe in everything we do. We have to observe two big topics, ground risk, air risk. Is a new transport mode on par in its safety with everything else that we know? And we have the typical technological challenge that we're introducing a new transport mode and from day one it has to be at least as safe as everything that has been developed over the last 100 years. That's quite a challenge to be honest. So let's talk a little bit about how we see a system evolving. Now we will be seeing air vehicles in reasonably short time. Depending on who you listen to or what magazine you read, it's somewhere between 24 and 27, others say 28, Holland Berga says 32, Morgan Stanley says 35, NASA says sometime in between, the US Air Force has a different opinion, so it's going to happen. It really will happen if we can combine it into one central traffic system. And I'd like to take you on a little adventure, and I'm going to stand up here so I can see my own slides, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to take you on a little adventure just telling you about what goes into creating one total system. Number one, what are we talking about? We're talking about managing vehicles in different orders of magnitude in a fairly confined airspace. Again, depending on who you're talking to, we're talking about 400 feet and, and, and uh, 4,000 feet. So 120 meters and uh, 1,200 meters. If you go to China, to the US, to Europe, you'll get different answers, but that's a fairly typical range. Now, most of that airspace today is not managed by anyone. Yes, there are some rules, there are rules of the air, there is overflight, um, there are minimum safe altitudes, etc., etc., but it's not managed airspace in the sense that you can fly multiple vehicles at the same time. So, what, what does air traffic management mean at the end of the day? you have a plan for how things need to work. The big, the buzzword here is deconfliction. You want to operate multiple aircraft in a, a manner that they don't crash into each other, they don't intersect with other traditional legacy aviation routes, that they stay clear of buildings, of obstacles, etc., etc. Now, if you want to distribute intelligence about traffic to the vehicles, you have to talk to the vehicles. It means data link, broadband data link, which, I'm sorry to say, does not exist in aviation today. People will kill me for saying this, but essentially there is no reliable broadband data communication, safety critically certified in aviation today. And there won't be for the next seven or eight years. High frequency connections are iffy. So we need a system that works around that. In any case, Data needs to be passed from the ground to the air, which means you need a system that has an avionics component. There needs to be a data integrator on board the aircraft that receives data that was sent from the ground and inserts it in an appropriate manner into the vehicle avionics. What kind of data do you want to transmit? Number one, you want to tell the aircraft, like in legacy aviation, where it needs to go, what its route is, what cleared routes are. You have to have algorithms that generate these routes, but then you need to communicate them. But even more important, you have to make sure that these routes are based on valid data. So you need to collect data. Collecting data is a major exercise which will be orchestrated by um, data gathering engines that accept certified data, aeronautical information data, weather data, obstacle data, topography data, airspace data, and 
combine it into an air situation image which then provides valid, a valid basis for routing um, determination. The regulators have already said that everything we do in future um, urban or regional air traffic needs to be fully integrated with legacy air traffic control. So we're talking to air traffic control. We need to be able to accept their known traffic patterns, accommodate them in our navigation, and transfer back the same information to remote air traffic control. Um, in both in the in Europe and in the US, people are talking about UTM systems, which is basically systems designed to manage unmanned traffic, which need to be integrated also. In the next step, air vehicle manufacturers are talking about detect and avoid mechanisms which allow them to deconflict tactically while they are flying, which creates an information base which also needs to be absorbed. At the end of the day, you find out that safety critical sensing on board aircraft is an expensive proposition and it may be valuable to provide communal sensing on the ground because that will reduce the cost of the vehicle and continued airworthiness. Next, you will talk to aircraft manufacturers who will tell you that the real key issue here is traffic density at landing uh, destinations, at, at, at departure and landing destinations, and uh, specif specific um, micro-navigation mechanisms are required for landing. It needs to be integrated. You need to talk to the fleet operators, you need to involve the cities into, in order to, make, to, to um, safeguard social desirability in the system. You need to integrate emergency services and you want to provide added value services like entertainment to the passengers, um, sightseeing information, whatever you, you have. So you see that anything that has to do with communication in the air starts to get complicated. It gets even more complicated because GPS is not terribly reliable. At the end of the day, you want to integrate GPS denied positioning, something like multilateration or what have you, to augment GPS positioning. And then you find out that there is no flight rules for all of what we're talking about. And initially, all of the aircraft manufacturers are building piloted aircraft. So if you ever want to build a system that complies with all of these requirements and is applicable at an early point, you need to support, piloted support, while vehicles are being piloted with onboard pilots. And at the end of the day, this whole system needs to be certifiable. Does this sound like a steep mountain to climb? Mm, I would say yes it is. We're happy to be in the middle of that game, and we're willing to talk to anyone who wants to um, support us in building an open and interoperable system supplying the services we just talked about. What we're doing as a company very, very shortly is right now we're creating a flight test area at the Augsburg Airport, which will be the first flight test area worldwide which is actually equipped with a type of traffic management system that allows vehicle manufacturers to operate in a kind of a real world managed airspace. And as all companies, we have to provide commercial traction while we get there. There's no way that anyone will finance us for a project that takes eight years. So uh, one of the initial use cases we're terribly excited about is creating a camera drone system for very heavy TV cameras, which will be geared towards creating high quality moving pictures for action sports. So, um, this is the idea of creating an entire system that will accommodate all of the great efforts that we're, we've been hearing about. Um, and I'm going to pass the microphone on to my colleague, Professor Holzapfel here, who's actually supporting us with his university department in our very effort. So, thank you, Corbin. And so, let's wait for the presentation. I think you put it very well that we're talking about enablers and um, I want to talk a little bit about flight controls because I think it's clear for everybody that these eVTOL airplanes will not be controlled like classical mechanical controlled airplanes. Uh, by the way, I also gave you the PPT so I can see the preview. And um, 
therefore it will be inevitable to have electronic flight control systems and if we imagine that there would be quite some of the vehicles then we cannot do it how it has been done in the past because otherwise we would disable urban aerial mobility because it would be very expensive and as a courtesy for attending my presentation I will tell you a little secret no, our car is not lifting off vertically. So many people go by and think this is our new UAV. Uh, it's not, this is just a test bed. So why am I sitting here as a university guy? I don't uh, see our group as a fundamental research group, but we do active development in different domains. So one of them is of course modeling and simulation, because if you want to develop something, you should know how it behaves upfront. And of course, when you model something, you want to know, is it realistic? So you must make ground tests and measurements. Then, based on your model, you can analyze your system and build flight controllers. But in the end, to make them resilient, of course, you need to take care about things like redundancy and you need to manage this redundancy. We do safety analysis, fault trees and modern ways of especially safety of intended function. Then, of course, we develop, and this is our core business, the control laws, like the nominal controllers, but also the emergency controllers, which are supposed to land you safely when everything else failed. And, of course, if you really want to fly it, you cannot stay away from the real hardware. And I'm very happy that a lot of our partners in different domains are also here at Aero. And so we integrate components and do a lot of hardware in the loop and ground testing. And of course, we need to deal with certification aspects because if you build something that doesn't satisfy uh, formal requirements, then you can maybe test it in a separated environment, but it can never turn into a product. And so, just as one picture, because it's here, our test van as a test infrastructure, you know, I don't want to comment about all the different areas, but if you wonder what can we get from them, you see a lot of air taxis or urban area mobility vehicles, which are so-called lift to cruise vehicles, where basically you accelerate after vertical takeoff to generate lift with wings. But during this transition, you have very slow slipstream conditions on your propellers. And if you do this with small models, then everything looks really nice. If you start to measure with big vehicles, then you will see that you get tremendous pitching up moments, which just can break your system apart. And so it really makes sense to know that ahead. Just like this, another big issue are things, for example, like vibrations. So here, for example, this is no simulation. This is vibration spectra of uh, the transition of a real 400 kilogram um, EV toll system. Likewise, it's about loads and their elasticity because with these propulsion systems being part of the flight control, of course, you get effects which you're not used to from your classical fixed wing aircraft. And if you don't account for them, you can break your system very quickly. So that was just the little summary why it's important to model and simulate up front when you develop your functions because you do not want to see any surprise and of course you want to do as much testing as possible before you really go flying to eliminate risk. When we talk about enabling, I'm not one of the believers who think that urban air mobility will be a substantial contribution to mass transportation. So there is other companies that say, ah, and there will be thousands of those vehicles flying in the air. I don't believe this, but I still believe that there will be many of them because there is different um, applications where they really make sense. And now imagine you have a high amount of vehicles flying around and every one of those vehicles would need a commercial helicopter pilot on board. I think this again would be a disabler because it would make it very expensive. So you have other people who say, ah, we immediately make this completely autonomous. My personal opinion is that we will see it quite soon 
to have manned systems doing commercial transport uh, with these e-vitals. But I think we're still a bit far away from the point where the passengers sit in, some, or let's say, in regulated areas like the EASA domain or the FAA domain, where basically passengers sit in the vehicle and no operators on board. So there must be something in between, between the fully rated, very expensive pilot and the full autonomy. And there is something which in the United States is already discussed with respect to regulation, and this is SVO, Simplified Vehicle Operations, where you still have an operator on board, but more something like an air taxi driver than a classical rated pilot, which of course means that you must make the basic flying much, much easier and much more intuitive. And this is of course only helpful if you can do this with a very high reliability. Because if you say in the nominal case, the system is tremendously supporting you and everybody can fly, but if there's a slight failure, then we go back to stick to surface, you don't have a pilot um, training, but now you have to fly almost unstable aircraft manually. This is something which no authority would accept. So which means that simplified vehicle operation, meaning giving high level command variables to the operator, like directly vertical speed or change of heading, is only successful if you, number one, can keep the behavior constant over the whole flight envelope, so the aircraft does not change the behavior, and number two, if you can deliver these functions with such a high level of reliability that basically in certification you can argue that this is the nominal operation of the system and the degradation to something very low level is so improbable that you no longer have to fully train the pilots to be commercial pilots. And our strategy to achieve this um, is, for example, using modern control strategies. As I don't have too much time, I just go ahead, which immediately brings us to the next question. How do we assess, is the aircraft easy to fly? And for that, in the special condition VTOL, you find, so it's an official EASA document, the handling quality rating method, which tells you dependent on the probability that you are in a certain flight phase, dependent on the probability of a certain failure, which handling qualities requirements do you have to satisfy, and which level of handling qualities do you have to provide. The numbers are not intended to be read from the audience, it's just to prove that this is something which is actually regulated. So the things are existing and so the question is how can you do that and one of the ways to do it is for some requirements you can analytic tests, for other requirements you have to do simulator tests and so for those simulator tests one of the big um, candidates is so-called mission task elements, MTEs, and we are very happy, for example, that we already could host the EVTOL flight test team from the FAA from the United States to do some of these um, MTEs together with them. And uh, for the staying flexible, we use a simulator where we have high quality control interceptors, but where instead of uh, building a cockpit environment, we use uh, virtual reality because of course it's much easier to adjust and modify if you do something new. So far I only talked about the functions, but of course um, people from industry always say and they're with that they're right, the function is only 10% of the development. You also have to look into the system architecture. And then I hear people discussing different aspects. And on my last slide, I just want to address one very important aspect. And this is something which I don't uh, invent, but it's something which is taken from the SCV toll. And I didn't take the final release. I took an intermediate version because it shows by the gray background that this was changed um, compared to the previous release. So you have to see the thrust units in the EV toll are no longer just propulsion systems, but now they're required for basic flight control. 
and this means that in contrast to a normal fixed wing plane, the criticality of your propulsion goes up. There are serious companies which are using up to 18 propulsion units. I think the most serious ones stop at 18 propulsion units. And so um, for that, of course, if you use 18 times or 10 times or 8 times the same propulsion unit, you immediately ask your question, um, if you use the same unit all the time, is there the possibility that there is a common mode failure which makes them fail all at the same time, right? And so this is something, you know, people always say, ah, and we need dissimilar flight control computers, and I use this sensor here, that sensor here, but if you use multiple times the same propulsion unit, how will you show that if you have a systematic error, your system doesn't crash? And this is also something basically where we are really working on a lot and um, I'm very happy that some of our partners are also uh, here on the Aerofair and if you're interested in this topic and in solutions to this topic uh, talk to me we are really happy to work with you. That ends my part and I hand over my microphone to the next speaker. Thank you Florian and it's, I think it's good you have to stop because your voice is fading if you, you can keep on talking probably won't hear anything anymore. So thank you. Our next speaker is um, uh, from the company Theon, which is doing batteries because we all know batteries are very important for what we want to do, electric flying, no matter what kind of aircraft we have. Dr. Ulrich Emes from the company Theon, he's telling us about it new type of battery where he is persuaded that it may change the game a bit for the EV dolls and for the others. <laughs> thank you Willy and, and especially thank you for getting this last minute opportunity to, to talk to you and thank you to the audience that they are still here. Um, yeah, but before we talk about our technology I would like to talk about uh, battery production in general. The battery industry is a very conservative industry they have very small production windows and they are really happy if one production line is running. So uh, it's not so innovative, so what is happening currently in all these gigafactories in Europe is a copy-paste from Asia to Europe, from a production technology point of view. Let's have a look to the materials now. The materials are the most important in the battery because it's 70% of the cost. And half of this cost is the cathode material. So if we want to bring costs down, we need to talk about cathode materials. And if we want to bring performance up, we also need to talk about cathode materials. And you can imagine what is our um, cathode material. It's yellow, it's, it's, it's sulfur. So when we have a look to the next 10 years, and we, we see the, the, the demand for batteries, this is today 800 gigawatt hours per year and it, it, it's, it's not unlikely that it's going to 8 terawatt hours per year. But if you have a look to this yellow curve, the yellow curve is a production capacity which is planned to be set up in the next couple of years. There is a gap. This is bad, but this is also our opportunity from a production capacity point of view. But even worse, is a demand for materials we need for these batteries. So it, it's, it's mostly nickel because they are shifting from cobalt to nickel. It is cobalt itself, it's lithium as well and there is a very big gap in materials. So we nearly need to, to think about how we can overcome this gap of these materials because then at the end we have the gigafactories but no materials. So our founder Marek Slavik a blessed electrochemic. He started to think about that 10 years ago. In Norway, he developed his first generation of lithium sulfur batteries. In Switzerland, he continued. And now, in the third generation, he founded the company Theon in Berlin. And now you know why our company is called Theon because this is a Greek word for sulfur. So it makes absolutely sense. It's a bit difficult to pronounce for German lung tank, but um, that is the reason why we call it Theon. The nice thing about sulfur, it's abundantly available. It's a byproduct. We don't need mining. It costs 20 cents per kilogram. 
compared to at least 20 euros per kilogram for standard cathode material NMC 811 for example. And what we experienced through the last weeks and months is that the prices for nickel and, and cobalt went up significantly. So it will not stop at 20 euros per kilogram. And this is a very big price advantage. Now from a performance point of view, there is an intrinsic energy, very high energy density of sulfur, x times more than standard cathode materials. But, and this is what Marek invented, is we cannot use the standard production process. So we cannot put the sulfur powder in the standard production line and expect that at the end we have a higher performing cell. Because there, is some, there are some electrochemical issues like uh, which uh, deteriorates the cycle life. So he thought about what I need to do in order to uh, manage the cycle life problem. And he de designed a completely new production process. So, and, and now you understand why we call our battery the crystal battery. Because we melt sulfur and then we put carbon nanotubes in that like in the concrete ceiling, and then we crystallize the sulfur. And this crystal structure is ideal to develop all this performance on cathode side for a battery. Then there are a couple of, of other process steps, like a special coating in, in order to have access electrically and thermically to the sulfur, and then a couple of other uh, process steps in order to add the electrolyte. In our generation one, we have still a liquid electrolyte, but generation two already next year, we will have then a solid electrolyte. We don't call our company an all solid state battery company because we believe it is not about the electrolyte being solid or liquid, it's much more about the cathode material because of its performance and the cost. By the way, then we have a solid electrolyte which, which is quite quite, uh, quite efficient. We have uh, 16 patents currently under development, so the whole process is designed and several proofs of concept has been successfully completed. Five of these patents are filed and the other 11 will be filed until the, year, the end of the year. So I can, I'm a bit cryptic about d describing these patents because it, it needs to be not to open, we need, we need to, 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 to write it first. So having of, of one sh in one sheet the advantages of this technology is we have three times the volumetric and gravimetric energy density compared to what we have today. And this is a very big advantage due to the, the uh, energy density of sulfur. And through, because of the solid electrolyte, we have a very safe cell. There is no burning element and sulfur is not, is not very critical to thermal runaway. And by the way, we have no oxide, so we have no oxygen and oxygen is needed for thermal runaway. So this we don't have. And last not but, but not least, a very important point is recyclability. In a standard battery we have aluminium foil, copper foil, lithium, uh, nickel, um, cobalt, um, electrolyte, a, a couple of uh, different metals which need to be separated. In our cell we have only lithium, sulfur, polymer electrolyte and carbon. This is very easy to separate, a very important point. So what does it mean then for our products? A bit fantasy, yeah? So we, we, we only need to charge our phone every second day, we can drive 1000 kilometers with the car, we can fly two hours, four hours, it, it depends now on how big it is the battery and, and how big is the plane, obviously. So there are a lot of advantages through this technology. So who is behind this company? Uh, uh, Marek Slavik, our blessed uh, electrochemist and the founder of the company. He started, as I explained, ten years ago. Um, so this electrochemic R&D capability is complemented by me, I'm a production guy. Um, and a gen general manager, but very important, and that is the oxygen for a startup, it's the money of the founder, and this is Lukasz Godowski. Lukasz Godowski, a very visionary investor, he has uh, invested in Volocopter, he has recently invested last year 100 million US dollars into Autoflight. So for him it makes a lot of sense 
to invest into Theon and to complement his other investments in flight technologies with very efficient, cost efficient and lightweight batteries. This is our team. Uh, we have seven nationalities, most of them PhDs. Looks like a men's club, but we, we are really looking currently for, for ladies and uh, hiring it. Um, sorry for that, but it's, it's early stage. But we are working really on that. Um, how we want to go to market? New technology, obviously, we will not jump into the biggest market from the first moment on. We will start with a niche market, and the niche market is rockets. The commercial rockets. There is, a, there is a pump in there which will be in the future be powered by a battery for three minutes, five minutes and we have a lot of requests exactly for our first generation of batteries to power such a pump. Then they can reduce complexity, they can reduce the, the, the weight and can increase payload so they can transport much more payload to the space. Next year then we will adjust EV tolls to air taxis and portable devices. So this is from a from a, um, a gigawatt hour point of view the next logical step. It's a lot of a lot of pieces, yeah, portable uh, devices. And then in 2024, then we believe, believe we will be ready to more demanding markets. All these preparation needs obviously time. So that is very briefly about um, Theon, where we are. We will have the first, and it will be certainly one of the questions, we will be having the first samples ready by the end of the year to hand over to customers. It will be a, a pouch cell, multi-layer pouch cell. And obviously, we are happy to work with you as partners on the technology side, but also on the customer side. And if you have too much money, you can also invest in us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A uh, little bit longer, but it's also very new first time, so I like to hear more, which is good. And I think a lot of you, especially as batteries, is one of the key items uh, for uh, flying with electric propulsion systems. Our next and last speakers before the Q&A session is Wolfgang Leider from the company ITK, ITK K, which is also, like our first speaker, a subsidiary of Bosch. Um, and they are as well uh, somehow up to now connected with a lot with cars and but they are really heading towards aviation so the stage is yours thank you very much Billy. so I will uh, gladly present uh, our offering our contribution to the uh, e-mobility in aviation uh, provided by ITK so we are driven by the three topics of electrification, connected and shared vehicles. And we provide these um, competencies mentioned here on the slide, which is engineering, systems engineering, software and systems engineering. We have a lot of experts in safety and functional safety in security, cyber security. And we provide um, algorithm design and software engineering from conceptual systems design to coding using image processing, artificial intelligence, and going from development to testing and verification and validation. And we provide this um, expert knowledge in different domains like um, automotive, healthcare, industry, and specifically also in aviation. And focusing on e-mobility, um, we try to reduce the ecological footprint through new yeah, technologies we provide. And we focus there on energy management, like battery management. And we provide um, uh, solutions for high sufficiency in powertrain and hydrogen systems development. For example, with uh, services using data analytics um, to monitor battery in the cloud, uh, digital twin or predictive maintenance solutions which help you to monitor system uh, status online um, through using data services. And we apply technologies in um, using seamless tool chain development, 
uh, using state-of-the-art tools and processes which are, yeah, which are used in, in all domains which I mentioned before. So we use model-based design, we use all kinds of development environments and um, we also focus on uh, using standards in the different uh, domains where we are active like DO 178 ENC in aerospace in order to provide solutions which really work in the different contexts. So we use these uh, competencies for example in um, electric mobility like in air taxi providing uh, solutions for um, simulation or even for, as I mentioned, for energy management. And um, we also uh, work on solutions to provide com uh, technologies and applications in drones, which you can hear, which you can see here on the fair in, in various uh, applications. Uh, quite interesting, and um, yeah, we use agile software development processes. And uh, beside pure electric um, system development, we are also developing hydrogen uh, systems using fuel cell as technology. We are also providing solutions in um, optimizing power electronics. We bring in this expertise from the automotive industry. And this is a topic I would gladly be present for further discussion. If you want to join us afterwards, after the discussion, I can gladly answer specific questions if you have. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are open for questions. We have a mic here. So if you have a question, uh, just lift your hand. Um, I know I've seen several people had to run looking to the watch because the thing is at such a show normally you have a lot of uh, other appointments. Uh, one thing is we have this book which is uh, from the fair we've done for the electric flight because over the years electric is growing here at Aero and uh, it is growing so now it's the, we have the A7 hall which is a major electric hall but in nearly every other hall there are also uh, electric uh, aviation companies so you will find them if you go through the pages and in the middle you have some uh, map of the show where you can see where all the electric companies are and if you have to leave we have a recording of this which will be on our channel and the internet at the eFlight Expo channel with uh, all the videos of the presentation so you can watch it afterwards. Now you have the chance to ask questions direct. I have some questions until the first questions may come in. Um, one uh, question would be to... Uh, ah, there is a... You have a question already? Uh, you're first. Huh? Okay, I have a question to Mr. Eisele, uh, to the tire battery. Uh, could you give some more information about uh, power density and life cycles and probably the cost per kilowatt hour, for example? Yeah, um, the life cycle in Gen 1 is 500 cycles uh, this year and next year 1000 for Gen 2 uh, until Gen 4. Um, energy densities um, or power density, that was a is, uh, target is 12,000 watt per kg. And the target price is, uh, on the cost, uh, is 30 euros per kilowatt hours. If we give this to the end customers, that is the question. <laughs> yeah. But this is due to the low cost of the cathode materials. And first sample for testing are available at By the end, end of the year. End of this year. Yeah. Okay. So you should have brought some samples here, I'm sure <laughs> people will stand in line to get them. Um, so, yeah, um, a question to ITK uh, would be, from my side, if you look at the uh, certification of software with EASA, with uh, FAA, uh, where do you see the largest difficulties, for example, in the software, more in the motor controller, more into the fly-by-wire system, or what do you, where do you see the 
the, the, the hardest piece in certification software? Well, I, th I, I would see it in, in, in both, both areas. So I can see a, a big priority on one of the two. So okay. yeah, I think uh, both are challenging topics and fly-by-wire is certainly uh, mm -hmm. probably the more challenging one. Okay, if fly-by-wire is most challenging, I would ask Florian. Uh, uh, like you're working on fly-by-wire quite a while, when do you think the first fly-by-wire aircraft, I don't say Evito, but just aircraft will be certified for GA? Because we know that big airliners like Airbus has introduced this de uh, decades ago, but what about uh, GA? Do you think there will be GA aircraft like we know them around here in Aero, which will be fly-by-wire soon? So I think for rigid body general aviation aircraft, a full fly-by-wire system just does not make any sense. So currently you see that already smaller, comparatively smaller business jets, like for example the Empire Legacy, are fly-by-wire aircraft, but there you're already, again, about 50 million euros of purchase price. I would say the UAM area is something where you're just forced to bring basically fly-by-wire systems into those vehicles. And I would say the certification of the fly-by-wire system itself, when you look at the software on the fly, uh, fly control computer, this might be just the same as for a larger aircraft. So this is nothing new. And also, if you um, plan to sell in higher numbers, it's also okay if this uh, produces a certain amount of cost. However, what really has to change is the cost per piece, so the cost of the component sold, because if there you stay with classical aerospace uh, pricing levels, you will just kill the market. And there is another important thing where I have a bit of a fear that Europe can be slowed down on the pathway to a fully certified system, you need to be able to do flight testing, be it unmanned, but still you need to fly transition, or be it manned. And my feeling is that currently Europe is setting the threshold, and especially Germany also, when we look at unmanned, for basically flight testing a little bit too high because we see large discrepancies between North America, Europe, and Asia. And if we want to keep our stake in this business, we at least on the testing side would need more flexibility. But now to answer your question, sports aircraft, fixed wing, full fly-by-wire, just doesn't make sense, so we won't see it. Won't see it. Okay, uh, I think you mentioned a good point, so we just can pass the microphone only one uh, person. Um, you talked about the test areas, so I suppose Corbin, as you're looking for markets for the system you're developing, that you try to get or you are getting involved with different test areas. Are you only looking for German sites or are you looking, for example, also in, in Europe or even uh, worldwide to establish uh, sky roads? Um, building flight test areas is not a core business of ours, but we have actually gained considerable interest in these flight test areas for the very reasons that Florian just mentioned. Um, we are in final negotiations with the city of Los Angeles, which actually wants to connect Van Nuys Airport with LAX through a drone corridor, and they're looking at our solution in order to create a viable flight test area there. Um, Enough and Enac in Italy are talking to us because they are interested in duplicating our flight test area. Why is that? Exactly for the reasons that Florian just mentioned. Um, the, we are about to shut down um, air vehicle development in, in Central Europe because, again, we are expecting safety standards which are, in some instances, even taller, higher, more complex than those that um, general aviation has to comply with. Um, if we can provide aircraft testing, uh, companies who want to test aircraft with a simple system that will guard their flight, which will make sure 
uh, again on a systematic basis that um, geofencing and geocaging will be observed, um, that reversionary procedures are in place for contingency maneuvers, etc. Again, one of the topics that uh, we are collaborating with with the Technical University and Professor Holzapfel. If we can provide um, this type of system, which by the way in the US has a name, it's called the Flight Termination System. Um, that is a, a, um, a technology that the US military employs frequently. We could protect flight test areas and thereby kind of free up that that space again for um, aircraft manufacturers in Europe. So the answer is, um, while it was not originally a business case for us, we are finding substantial interest in duplicating what we're doing in Augsburg worldwide. Okay, thank you. Question to Rolls-Royce would be, you are working now in the on one side on the propulsion system, I heard also on the charging side, so is this all Rolls-Royce electrical or are there different branches of Rolls-Royce involved? So the propulsion system side that's Rolls-Royce electrical and since the 1st of um, January this year we are a standalone business unit within Rolls-Royce Group and however the energy solution yeah, goes back to Rolls-Royce power system so also based like formerly MTU here and now they are also focusing on sustainable technologies, as I just said, hydrogen, hydrogen solutions, but also fuel cells, electrolyzers. So we really feel that we need to get away from diesel and gas sets. And, and where are you based? Uh, the power systems? Uh, the power systems headquartered in Friedrichshafen, and then the innovation hub for sustainable is in Berlin. I think that's what I, uh, the people from the fair told me. I have to mention this question, so that we see that Friedrichshafen is really a focus, <laughs> because they always have a little bit of problem here that if Friedrichshafen with a show has to compete for the EV tall scene with uh, Los Angeles, Paris, uh, Shanghai, it's difficult. So they really want to get a little push and. Another question to uh, on the next, just one side right, to Christian, would be uh, FACC. FACC is working on the airline side and we heard before what Florian said that if the costs stay there where they are with uh, large aviation, there is no way that eVTOL or even uh, electric commuters will become so important like we think now because they will be just too expensive. So when you're thinking of your cost structure at, at FACC, is this something where you consider it and say, no, there we have to have a di uh, different price? Probably from the beginning because I think these small companies will not be able to, to start investing hundreds of millions in production facilities before they can get out uh, the vehicles. Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. I already mentioned it uh, before. Uh, the target is minimum 30% and more to go down. Uh, otherwise, it makes no sense. So, we investing since more than four years now uh, in those te technologies I, which I presented, so uh, cost down, tech frequency down, output up, so this is it. That's the, the key solution. Uh, one sentence uh, to the test flight areas, maybe you know it, FSCC holds 18% of Air Labs, which is a consortium of 27 companies in Austria, uh, providing five te uh, flight test areas and hopefully the first one Schnee Alpe will be open soon and, and for more will follow. One of those five is at FSCC. Okay, very good. So I think I have time, although our uh, crowd is fading away. <laughs> Uh, which is clear because we are over one hour and only at the show. So I have one last question to Bosch, then we are one time through. Um, there have been the focus on the, the sense box, which was announced some years ago, then, and on the sensors, because sensor is something which is very important for uh, vehicles, especially if the vehicles at some point want to operate autonomously because there is no pilot who has his natural sensors on there. So what can you tell me about the sensors which you take from cars? Will there be 
or are there already available for electric aviation systems already like you have for example with spark plugs and other parts from the conventional aircraft side? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. And I think uh, one of the topics that have been discussed here a few times is if this product can be uh, successful, it needs to be mass produced and it needs to be more cost efficient. And I think a lot of technologies from automotive, uh, that is where automotive is good, producing high quantities, high quality uh, at, at relatively low cost. So we are now still in the very early phase where prototypes are built using a lot of uh, aerospace technology. If this, goes in, if this technology evolves and uh, goes into series capable designs, I think that is a good entry where you can look to more automotive sensors and technology to incorporate in the design to in the end being able to build a high quality cost efficient uh, vehicles. Uh, to your question, I can uh, uh, give an uh, example that last year we industrialized our uh, microelectronical mechanical sensor, our gyro sensor combining acceleration and gyro sensitivity as an aviation product. So we, we slowly go into the direction to open up the uh, automotive sensor portfolio and bring that into aviation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Um, we're done. It's a uh, one hour, 20 minutes, so I think it's enough. Thank you very much and hope to see you again at another event we will have on electric aviation because there are a lot of things to discuss in future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you really. How can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com Then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, eVTOLs and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air. Or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.
sky.